let me fiddle with my phone for my timer. Hold on, sorry. Okay, so um, I haven't talked here before, so I'll introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm Ben Clifford. I'm pretty excited by programming languages in general. Um, so recently for work, I've been doing Python most recently. I've done a bunch of paid Haskell work. I've also taken money to do Java, PHP, Fortran, things like that. On, on the fun side of things, I'm pretty interested in Rust, um, the dependent type Idris stuff I quite like, Lua appeals to me. And then away from programming languages, I build a bunch of projects with LEDs, usually controlled by some of these languages. Um, so there's my GitHub, uh, if you want to look at it. Um, this talk is going to be an experience report, really, of me starting um, on a new project, well, moving to a project that existed already, I'd been a, a functional programmer working in entirely in Haskell, really. And I moved to work with a new group that had a, an existing code base in Python. Um, and this talk is some of my experience um, to do with that. So I'm not going to try and convince you this is an FP talk. You can make up your own mind. You probably already have made up your own mind about things like static types, if they're good or bad or whatever. Um, you form your own opinions there. I'm not going to try and convince you. Um, this talk is also not going to be a tutorial. So I'm just going to sometimes throw random bits of Python in. And if you can figure out what I mean, then that's good. And if you need me to explain it, please interrupt. And um, and I can, I, can, I can explain stuff in a little bit more depth. Um, but it, but it's structured mostly as a ramble about my experience rather than a rather than a tutorial. So the the project that that, that I moved on to is called Parcel, and it's a Python library for you to write scientific code and run that scientific code at large scale on um, usually supercomputers. So um, if you imagine doing some astronomy processing on a thousand nodes. Each node has 68 cores. That's the sort of scale that some of our stuff runs at. And the library is intended to, to help you um, run, scale your Python code up to run, run on that. So um, the group's mostly based around the University of Chicago. Um, though there are a lot of other people around the place at other institutions and, and remotely. So it's academic. There's a lot of building features just to see if they're, they're interesting for research purposes. And then if that's interesting, we kick them out the door and, and let other people play with them. And why do we use Python? Well, everybody in quotes uses it in our target fields. So, so if we're gonna go into to these target fields, we need to support the language that everybody else is using. So I was interested in this because I moved to this dynamically typed code base and it was just horrific. There's all kinds of dynamic type errors, like you'd be five hours into running on a thousand nodes of computation and suddenly you get some error that a string is not an integer. And th those are sort of classic bugs that you should be able to detect statically and we weren't detecting statically. And I'd also seen um, on a different project that there is some stat there was some static typing stuff starting to happen for Python at the time. So I wanted to investigate how that worked separate from my project. And as time has passed, this has turned into a pretty decent tool for reliability for finding problems um, before they before they hit our end users. Um, one thing especially is that some of our code is specific to running on specific supercomputers. So our CI doesn't run integration tests for that. So without static checking, there would basically be no checking at all about what's happening. So I will brief, briefly introduce what types look like in normal Python without, without any um, static type checking. So, Values have types, variables don't have types. So here's a variable x and I can put into x the integer three and I can say, tell me the type of x and that tells me int. And that, that is saying, 
take the value that is in X and tell me the type of that value. And then in the same X, I can put um, the empty dictionary. So Python has dictionaries like JSON style dictionaries. I can put the empty dictionary in and say, take the value that is in X now and tell me the type of that. And it's a different type. Okay, the, val the values have strongly defined types, but the, the variables do not. Um, and that is something that when you move to static typing, we're going to move to the variables having types. So there's, there's a syntax extension for Python, which has been around for a long time, like a, a decade or most of a decade, um, but, it, but it's not massively widely used. So here's a function at the top, um, which squares the parameter and there's no type information. You pass in some object and we try and multiply it by itself. And if I pass in an object that is this number, then it will work. And if I pass in something else, it will get all the way down to the multiplication and then explode. So Python has the syntax where you can now add type annotations. It looks pretty normal. So um, it's my variable y and I just say colon float. And the return value is arrow float. That looks pretty much identical to say Rust, for example, how you specify types in Rust. And I can say variable X has type float, populate it with the result of, of calling square. None of that looks um, hopefully surprising in any way at all. But if you run this code, the type annotations don't do anything. So if I run this and I say, take the square of the empty list and assign it to a float, it, it runs and it crashes here. It doesn't, it doesn't pay any attention to this type signature at all. It lets me go into square and still try and run that. And so the core Python code um, doesn't do any type checking at all because it is intended that you plug in your own additional stuff to use those type annotations in some way that is useful. So in the project that parcel that I'm working on, there are um, two ways in which we use, we use this. So runtime checking is, is the, the straightforward way. Here's my function. If you add this line on the front, um, at type checked or at, at type guard type checked. And now I try and invoke it. I get a different type error that says argument Y must be a flow to an int. You gave me a list. Okay. So that is happening at the point that, um, square is invoked. And in this example, it just looks like a one line difference. But if you imagine this is a, a hundred line function body, then we're now getting a much more meaningful error at the start of the function instead of some strange thing deep in the bowels that you that you have to um that you have to to um try and figure out this is also really <clears throat> um the easiest sell for type annotations to existing python developers i found because it's a really it's really easy to explain what's happening here you can just imagine that when I put this on the front, it's just put a load of if statements or asserts at the start of the function that check all the types. There's no inference. There's nothing weird static typey going on. It's just sticking in a bunch of if statements for you. So we use this a bunch. It's not super interesting from a type perspective. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it too much in the rest of the talk. The other, the other thing that we use, um, that uses these, these annotations is a tool called MyPy, and that's a static analyzer. So if I say, if I put all of this in a source file and then I run MyPy source.py, um, it doesn't try and run the code. It just gives me, it does the type checking, excuse me, and tells me argument one to square. You've given me a list, I wanted a float. And that as well should just look like pretty normal type checking. Um, there shouldn't be any surprises there to someone who's used to static checking. Um, so there's a, a type hierarchy. This is an object-oriented language. So I'm just going to briefly show some of the syntax here. Um, a float is a float. A float is also an object. An empty list 
we ask for the type of the empty list, well, it's a list, it's also an object. Um, we can ask questions like, is 1.23 one, uh, an object? Yeah. Is the empty list an object? Yeah. Is 1.23 a list? No. Nope. That also shouldn't be surprising. Um, and so I can say, all right, I'm going to pass a, a, a oh, I'm missing a, no, I'm not. I can pass a float in here because this wants an object and a float is an object. There, there's, there's nothing weird there. So the only weird bit I think so far, if you're used to static type checking in any language at all, is that this runs separate from any sort of compilation runtime um, behavior. You, you run MyPy, for example, we run MyPy in our, in our CI, in our test suite. So it runs as if, kind of as if it was a lint tool or a, a format formatting tool rather than, a, rather, um, or as a unit test tool rather than um, where more traditionally you would expect your type checking to happen as part of compilation. Um, this doesn't change the runtime. The runtime is still completely dynamic. This just gives you more confidence that when the dynamic running happens at runtime, it's not going to hit um, certain failure modes because you've checked it statically. So that so far was the easy introduction to um, Python typing. And I hope that I have convinced you that it is nice and simple and not hard to do and you should do it. And what I'm gonna do in the next set of slides is talk about stuff that I think is pretty um, horrible sometimes or interesting or unlike other type systems that, that I encountered um, before. So the first one is gradual typing. So um, because Python programmers are used to living in this very dynamically typed environment, they write code that is often quite hard to write static types for. And one of the things you can do um, is use gradual typing, which lets you say, all right, this little bit of code, I don't want to have type checked. I, I just pretend it's dynamically typed. And you do that using this magical type called any here. So an example, I've said y is a variable called any. It's allowed to have anything in it. So I can put a list in it. And I'm going to call a function which wants a float. And to this function that wants a float, I'm going to pass an any. Well, that's allowed as well. So we end up with this weird equivalence relation that I've started off with a list and going via any, I've passed into a function that wants a float. That's clearly wouldn't statically type check, right? And, and putting in any lets you say, well, okay, let's just hope that this works. And if you try this in, in um, Python, you get an error at runtime. Um, about not being able to add one onto a list. Um, so what this lets you do is you can start with your code base completely untyped. Um, essentially, either implicitly or explicitly, everything is in any type. And then you can tighten up bits that you're, you, that you're willing to work on um, whilst explicitly marking some stuff as, as dynamically typed still. So... There's, there's loads of little little Python idioms that don't don't work well for static typing. Here's one I've seen a few times recently. We're going to use this variable a, um, and we're going to go down and refine um, a series of results and store the intermediate result each time inside the variable a, so it gets more and more refined. Um, so potentially, the value stored in variable a could have four different types in this code fragment. And in dynamic normal Python, that's fine. A doesn't have a type, A just stores values and the four values have different types. Um, so with a simple example like this, it would be pretty straightforward to rewrite it. Use four different variables or turn it all into one line or, or something like that. 
Um, but what you can do is say that A has the type any, and it will allow this code that lets A have all kinds of, all kinds of types. So um, there's also a Python style where you kind of write a function and you can pass in different different kinds of different types of object and it will dispatch differently based on the type. So how do you, you type that? There's a, a type called union here. So this is a little bit like a, a sum type, like an either type in Haskell, um, but not quite. So I've said this is a union of float and string. And what that says is that X can be a float or X can be a string. Um, but it's not a disjoint sum type. So there's no left or right like in Haskell. Um, and to type check that, the uh, MyPy recognizes this particular structure of if statement as a, um, as a special idiom. So once I've che type checked this, I know that X here is a float because I've just checked it here. Okay. So if I didn't have this check, I wouldn't be allowed to multiply X by two because floats, yeah, we know how to multiply by two. Strings, we don't know how to multiply by two. But you can put in this type refinement here that refines for this code block the union, the union of these two down to a float. So union kind of acts as this superclass to, to float or a super, super type uh, to both float and string without being explicitly listed in the type hierarchy. Um, and so there's another type called optional, which looks pretty much like optional X is the same as union of X and the special magic password, uh, Python value called none. Um, so that's how you type a value. Um, that's how you would return null pointers or, or whatever you want to, to call that in Python. Okay, um, another thing that's big in Python is duck typing. So the, the classic definition of that is if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. And the example I'm gonna use here is uh, using the Python built-in function len, which tells you the, the length of an object. So I've defined a function here, print len, which just does the print, does a print of the length. And if I run that, well, I can pass in the empty list and it will print zero. I can pass in the empty dictionary and it will present, uh, print zero. I can pass in a string with five letters and it will print five. If I pass in this float, it will give me a type error that says float doesn't have a, a len implementation. So what type could I put here? If you're used to Haskell, you would maybe think type classes. You would maybe have a length type class. If you're used to Rust, you would maybe think a Rust trait um, to represent length. And uh, statically type Python has something similar called a protocol. So I'm going to, I this, this bit of code here is in the standard library for uh, Python, but in a, a different form. So I've kind of made it look a little bit simpler here. But this says, I'm gonna define a protocol called sized and this protocol has a method called len, which returns an int. So this kind of looks like a, a type class definition or a, a trait definition. Um, and now I can um, type print len as x has to be sized. So again, I can pass these in and, and, and get the correct values. I can ask, is a dictionary an instance of sized? Yes, it is, okay. And now I can statically type check this. So if I put this into a source file, print len 100 and run it, I'll get a static type error that says, um, you can't give me an int, I want it as sized. Again, this is not quite Rust Haskell style traits or type classes. So um, here's a class A I've just made. I've given it a made up len method that just returns one to eight as a constant. So I should now be able to take, if I make an instance of this class, I can ask for its length and it tells me 128. 
If I ask if it's an instance of sized, I get told true. If this was Haskell or Russ, there would be some kind of instance declaration that says A is a sized type. Um, but this, um, this happens magically with Python protocols. Okay, so that, that's what duct typing is. Um, a is sized because it has a len method, not because I have says said it is sized. Okay, and so protocols are in an attempt to pull that that um, behavior in into the type system um, because they're trying to preserve a a Python dynamic type idiom rather than push a Haskell style nominal type system onto things. Okay, this is a pretty ugly bit of code, but I want just want to introduce it. You can, if you want to, um, do dynamic arguments and say, just give me a list of, when, when this function is called, just give me a list of all the arguments and a list of all the keyword arguments. Um, so I can then take the length of that list and the length of the keyword arguments or do whatever I want. So I can essentially say, just give me the arguments. I am going to process them in my own code in whatever way I want with whatever crazy stuff I have, I have dreamed up. Um, so that's very hard to type because you can write any kind of, any kind of processing you want for the, for these argument lists. Um, and we had a bunch of this in our code base. And at least for our project, my gut feeling has been, if I ever see this um, star args or star star keyword args, it needs to go away for me to make any progress on typing things. Um, and I, I, I think it, it, it feels very much to me like the whole um, statically type printf stuff that the that, that, that people write in, in every language there is, they're like, this is our really awkward way to encode statically typed printf in, um, in our type system. This is the, the same awful mess and stay away from it. But I wanted to introduce this as an intermediate stage to something even more horrific, which is called decorators. Um, so this is a really nice thing, really, really nice thing in Python that I really like. Um, but it is extremely dynamic. And so it's extremely hard to um, do type checking on. Um, but there's some progress being made. So I th this is, I think, the most, maybe the most interesting bit to me that is novel for, for static typing in Python. So a decorator is a line like this. So right before my function definition, I can stick in a line at and something. Um, so this is what I showed earlier. Type, type guard is a decorator. <clears throat> and it says, all right, you've defined this function square, but I'm going to mess with it now and give you a different function that is going to behave differently based on what I want. And so what type guard does, for example, is it returns a function that um, checks the types and then Runs the runs the function you defined, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a the one I really like is called Flask. It's a library called Flask, and that's a that's for writing web servers, web applications in Python. So here I've said if you hit if you hit my web server with slash post slash seven, then the way to get the content for that page is by running this decorated function with the parameter seven. Um, and so you can, you can just stick, stick decorators like this on the front of a regular function and suddenly they appear as URLs on, on your web server. Um, so there's all kinds of flexible stuff you can, you can do with decorators. What they look like, um, if you imagine them being desugared is if I've got a decorator called my decorator and I'm going to, um, decorate this function kind of desugars into kind of a lambda, lambda function that is the original function. And then I pass that function into my decorator and that is what gets bound to the, the, the original, original function name. So my decorator is just a regular Python function. It can do anything it wants. 
Uh, it doesn't even have to return a function. It could return an integer if it wants to. Um, so typing that is pretty hard. Um, what are you going to put in your type signature down here for um, a decorator? It's got to take it's got to take something and it's got to return something. And in in the very easy case, so here's a, a decorator which just returns the original function that you gave it. And at least in this case, I can make a type variable which behaves like a type variable in other languages. I can say, all right, I'm going to take a function with a particular signature and I'm gonna return a function with exactly the same signature. So in a really simple case, that is um, easy to do. And kind of like type guard in the previous slide, that, that, that would have been fine. Um, if you wanna start doing interesting stuff with arguments though, that gets quite hard. So an example in our project parcel, we, um, we have a decorator called Python app. And what that does is takes your function and makes it so it will run somewhere else on your supercomputer asynchronously. So I've defined a function which takes an int and returns a string, but actually when I decorate it, it's gonna take an int and it's gonna return a future, a promise, and that future will eventually return a string. But I need to, 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 to type, to define the type for this properly. I would need to somehow edit this type signature to jam in a future somewhere. And that's um, that's not really there at the moment. There's some stuff in uh, Python 3.10, which is just coming out, which I haven't looked at yet that makes it easier. But um, this is the decorated typing is the challenging thing for me. So the last bit is co and contravariance. So this is this gets mentioned in a bunch of other functional programming stuff but I've never really had to think about it quite so much as uh, with, with uh, Python. And I think that's because there are more subclasses and more type hierarchies, and there are also mutable objects. And those two things interact in a way that really causes some, um, causes some trouble. So here's a classic example. There's an animal, a dog class, which is a subclass of animal. So we've got dog, animal, object. If I've got a list of animals and a function which given a list of dogs is gonna add a dog into that list. So remember that this is a mutable list um, and this will mutate the list when I call it. Is this valid code? Does this, does this work? If you look at it, yeah, this is fine, right? I'm gonna end up with the animals list having a dog in it and that's allowed by the type. But if I have this, an animals list, with some cats, dogs, cows, whatever in it. And I have a, another function, count dogs, and I'm gonna pass count dogs a list of dogs, just like the previous slide. And well, I know these are all dogs, so I can just take the list of the length. And if I say count dogs animals, does that make sense? It doesn't, right? So this, there's, there's something going on here where sometimes it makes sense to, to believe this subclassing and sometimes it, it, it doesn't. So that's what contravariance and covariance are. So covariance is when um, there's a subclass relation, dog is a subclass of animal. Does that mean a sequence of dogs is a subclass of a sequence of animals? And there's a, a Python static type called sequence, which is a read only um, type that is types of lists and tuples and things like that. And it's important that it's read only because it's read only. That means that a sequence of dogs is always a sequence of animals. If, if it was mutable, then that wouldn't be true. And the opposite of that is contravariance. That means that this subclass relationship dog is every dog is an animal, uh, means that, um, the, the, for certain structures, that relationship gets uh, flipped around. So this is the type for a function which takes an animal, and this is the type for a function which takes a dog. So imagine, and this is gonna be a function which is going to take an animal and print, print out some description of it. So every function which takes an animal and gives me a string is also a function which will take a dog and give me a string. 
So that subclass relationship was dog animal here, but animal dog here. And this comes up really in my experience with passing lists around because lists are um, sometimes treated as mutable, sometimes treated as um, just a source of values. And at the type level, you have to pay attention to that a lot more. So you either can have um, structures be covariant, contravariant, or if they're neither, they're um, invariant, which list is. Okay, so last slide, you talk about what I think about this. Well, in development, there's, in my head, there's two piles of stuff that I've done. We've got the easy stuff, which is the first pass of this presentation. We put that in our master. It doesn't need a recent Python. It's very simple type annotations. None of the nonsense of the second half of this talk. If something gets complicated, just stick any on there and it's fine, right? It's better than better than not having any checking. It's really easy for everyone to understand, which reminds me quite of the there's the Haskell 98 crowd that don't think you should use anything more advanced than Haskell 98. Just pretty simple. I want an int. You give me an int. Fine. Um, there's pretty high payoff in a few places there. So I mentioned before that we get good payoff for um, testing stuff that we can't integration test on the supercomputers. It also catches loads of stuff in our error handling code because most of our integration tests check the success path, not the error handling path. Um, and in practice, we're using TypeGuard where our, our users call into our code and MyPy to check how our code fits together with itself. Then separately, there's the hard stuff. So that is just for me, really. That's a separate branch from my exploration. Um, sometimes I discover bugs there and I go and fix the bugs that I've discovered on my branch and fix them in master. I don't necessarily put type types in because these might've been found by some really weird types. I don't want to force this complication onto some very innocent dynamic Python programmers. Um, and this also is very liberating because I can do whatever I want. I can play with type checker plugins. I can use very recent versions of, of Python and things like that. Okay, so that's my talk. Thanks, Ben. Um, not sure how I, I, I like I like the uh, I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that this has um, come to the Python world, actually. Yeah. So if you look at the if you look at the dates of some of the original stuff that put type annotations in, it's 2013, 2014. It's been around years. I think I just lost track of Python after when, when did I last look at it? I think I did the. Uh, MIT course intro to computer science that uses Python, but I think I did this over 10 years ago. Yeah, it, it's, it's very rarely introduced though, because you, you, you kind of have to be sold on static typing, which is a certain kind of nut job. <laughs> I mean, thing, right? this is, yeah, I hope this, this meetup is like a, a home for those nut jobs. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. So is it, is it considered now, um, I know that there's this notion of being Pythonic in the Python language community. And yeah. is this being embraced as something that is Pythonic or is it still kind of like on so the periphery? My Pi lives in, so the, the type syntax annotation is just in Python, right? You can just stick that stuff in your Python code. You don't need to change any compilers or not, uh, interpreters or anything. Um, my Pi, the static type checker is hosted in the official Python GitHub. Uh, Guido van Rossum will reply to your comments if you open an issue there. So it is pretty, pretty attached to the core of Python. Okay, so I want to invite people to ask questions. First, Mika has a question. Mika, go ahead and unmute. Hi, Ben. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. It's uh, really Hi. illuminating. As a long-time Python developer who hasn't really done much with static types because it just seems a bit of a mess sometimes. Um, but um, I can kind of see the advantage of having this gradual typing if you're like coming to a fresh, like a, an existing code base that doesn't yep. have any type annotations. Yep. Do you know if there's like a way of configuring MyPy to forbid like gradual typing or any types to kind of force you to go all yes. or nothing? Yeah, so there's a, there's a config file um, which, so MyPy def by default won't touch any functions which don't have um, any type definition. definition any type definitions in them. 
and various things like that. So it will try to be very liberal in what it accepts, but you can control by module basically. So by source code file, um, a whole, a whole um, set of options like disallow any, you must type check everything in this file. You can say um, whether um, optionals are allowed or not, implicit optionals. So if I take an int, should I also take a, a none value? Um, so it's just an, 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 an any file called mypy.ini that you put in your in your source tree. Cool, thank you. So yeah, so what what I in practice what I do is when I'm in the mood for doing this, I will try and turn off one of one of those allowances and then try and fix all the bugs that that introduces. 